We are in the second week of our teaching series on what it is to be a Lutheran, and I shared some fun examples last week of how you might know if you are a Lutheran or not, so I have a few more examples. You might be a Lutheran if the only open pew is up front, so you volunteer to shovel the sidewalk. Oh, wait, I see people in the front pew. Oh, I remember. You guys are baptism families who are supposed to sit up front, and you were made to sit there. Otherwise, I know you would not be willingly sitting in the front pew. Or you might be a Lutheran if you don't know what was so funny about that movie Fargo then. And you might be a Lutheran if your house is a mess because you are saved by grace, not by works. That was my favorite. I want to put it on a pillow or something because I, I like that a lot. But as I also said last week, these are more cultural traits of Lutherans who live in the upper Midwest. These actually don't define our core beliefs as Lutheran Christians. So what does define us as Lutheran Christians? It is that arrow pointing down right there. The book we are reading called Claiming the L Word that goes along with this teaching series is talking about what is at the core of our beliefs. And the author of the book came to Lutheranism later in life and she went to seminary and she said that in one of her first classes, the professor was talking about this arrow and the way he got to it was he was trying to explain some finer point of Lutheran theology and all the whole class was distracted. It was a beautiful fall day. Everybody was wishing they could be outside. They just weren't paying attention. And so the professor then just wrote an arrow pointing down on the board and he walked out of the room halfway through class and didn't come back. And she said she snapped to attention and she drew the only logical conclusion, he thinks we are all going to hell. <laughs> and so the whole class was paying attention the next day when they all gathered for class again. And the professor explained that this arrow pointing down is to remind us that God always comes to us. We don't work our way to God, God finds us. That is central to our belief as Lutheran Christians. And since we are talking about Lutheranism, I am going to reference Martin Luther. This is how he explains the third part of the Apostles' Creed that we just recited together during the baptisms. He said, I believe that by my own understanding or strength, I cannot believe in Jesus Christ my Lord or come to him, but instead the Holy Spirit has called me through the gospel. So we can't come to God on our own. We can never figure out God completely by ourselves or through our own reason, God has to come to us. And the story that we have from Mark's gospel is a perfect case in point. The gospel of Mark is a little bit different than the other three gospel books of the New Testament. It tells about the life and death and resurrection of Jesus like the others, but it's shorter than Matthew and Luke and John. It has kind of this hasty, unpolished way about it. And it gets to the point from the first chapter of Jesus preaching, teaching, healing, bringing the kingdom of God to people. It skips over his birth, his early life. And from the first page of the Gospel of Mark, we see all these things that Jesus is doing. But the story that we have today is smack dab in the middle of Mark's Gospel. After Jesus has been doing a whole bunch of things, he finally asks his disciples, who do people think that I am? And they give him some good answers. John the Baptist, Elijah, another great prophet. But then Jesus asks them personally, who do you think I am? And Peter was so wise in that moment. And he said, you are the Messiah. And if you caught it in our Spark Children's Bible, instead of saying Messiah, it said, you are the one God sent to save the world. That's an exact, dead-on definition of Messiah. 
And Peter is so excited that he has figured out who God is and that he is with this very God, the one sent to save the world. And he starts to envision Jesus gaining all sorts of power and acquiring an army and taking power and knocking out all the bad guys and marching into a palace. And Peter gets to be on his right hand when Jesus becomes king. And right in the middle of his daydream, where Peter's thinking how he's going to be chief of staff in the Jesus presidency, Jesus keeps talking. He says, okay, now that you know who I am, now that you know that I am the Messiah, here's the plan. I'm going to suffer. I'm going to be rejected. I am going to die. And then I'm going to be raised again. And that just didn't make sense with everything Peter was just imagining. And he took Jesus aside. He thought, you know, we've been on a long walk. Perhaps Jesus is dehydrated. I just need to straighten him out a little bit. But Jesus really meant to say what he just said. And he actually straightens Peter out. And he says, get behind me, Satan. Your mind's not in the right place. You are getting in the way of God's plan. And whenever I share this reading in the congregation, I always am thinking, who am I going to look at when I say, get behind me, Satan? Because I don't want any individual person to think, is she talking to me? No, but each and every one of us could claim that title whenever we get in the way of God and what God's plans are. And then Jesus invites a whole crowd to come in here as he says, if you want to follow me, you've got to deny yourself, take up your cross, and come with me. And if you want to save your life, the way to do that is by losing it. And then he says, now I'm on my way to Jerusalem to die. Who's with me? Now this just didn't make any sense to the disciples and to the crowd as they were listening to him. This did not compute. If he's the one that God sent to save the world, how is he going to do that by dying? It didn't make sense. It's like you're in a football game. Say you are on the winning team and it's halftime and you're in the locker room and you would imagine your coach saying something like, Okay, everybody, stay in the game. Still a lot of ball to be played and whatever they say on ESPN Sports Center about executing plays and staying focused. Perhaps the talk that the football players got at Moorhead High School on Friday night when they were beating the Brainerd Warriors 28 to 0. The players would be expecting to hear, keep it tight, we will win this. If you keep it together, stay focused. But what if instead of that, the coach were to say, I want you to go out there and get creamed. I want you to lose this thing. I want you to be crushed. I want you to let everything through. The players would just, what? That doesn't make sense. Or maybe that could have been said. There was a game yesterday, too. Wait, who was? It was played by two North Dakota teams. Okay, I'm not clear on it. Anyway. It wouldn't make sense for players to hear that from their coach. It just wouldn't. And it doesn't make sense for the disciples either. They were on the winning team. They were with the Messiah. They wanted to win it in the way that they imagined it. But God had a different plan. And Mark's gospel illustrates this so brilliantly. This is the halfway point of Mark's gospel gospel. This is the turning point in Mark's gospel. Everything that happened before and everything that happens after is different because of this moment. The moment that people know who Jesus is, is the moment that they start to see him more clearly. The powerful people start to hate him because they are threatened. The outcasts start to love him because they hear something they've never heard before. And the disciples just get stupider. And this was pointed out at first service that stupider isn't a word, that it's more stupid. But I think stupider sounds more stupid. So that's why I'm saying it that way. Because they had to unlearn everything that they thought they knew about the Messiah. This is the game changer. This is the midpoint. This is the turning point where all of a sudden everything changes. And there's a story that can shed light on this very moment. Right before Jesus reveals who he is and what God's plan is, he heals a blind man. And that's common. We see a lot of those healing stories. But this is a different healing story because Jesus first, well, and he uses spit, but get beyond that. He spits on the guy's eyes and lays his hands on the guy's eyes and says, can you see? 
And the man says, I can see people, but they look kind of like trees walking. So Jesus has to lay his hands on him again and then says, can you see? And the man can see clearly from that point. This two-stage healing story illustrates what happens between the first half of Mark's gospel and the second half. In the first half, people aren't seeing Jesus clearly. They see him doing all these cool things, healing, teaching, preaching, bringing the kingdom of God, but they bring all of their own interpretations to it. In the second half of Mark's gospel, they are seeing clearly. And the people who have power know how powerful Jesus is, and it makes them mad. And the people who are outcasts hear that they are included in something they've never been welcomed to before. And the disciples, who were really trying to be faithful and good students, all of a sudden have to unlearn everything they thought they knew about the Messiah. This is a turning point. And just like that two-stage healing story from blindness to kind of seeing to clear vision, Jesus didn't give up on that man he was healing. He kept laying his hands on him till he could see fully. And Jesus didn't give up on the disciples no matter how stupid they got throughout the rest of the gospel. He kept revealing himself to them. And Jesus doesn't give up on any of us no matter how dim we are in our vision of who God is in our life. Now, today is Confirmation Day, later this afternoon for our 10th graders. They will be affirming their baptism, that they will be taking ownership of their faith, that just like these children were being introduced to God for the first time and their parents were making the promises for them, our 10th graders will be saying, I believe you are the Messiah for themselves this afternoon. And this is a turning point for those confirmation students. As Linda Bartholomew always tells them, this is just the beginning. There is so much more to learn. You never graduate from learning about God or growing in your faith. She is so right. We never graduate from learning about God and we never graduate from unlearning things that take us off the right path. This is a turning point for our students. They've been learning certain things. They've been following all sorts of rules and coming to class and doing sermon notes. And today we say it's not about that. It is about something bigger that's going to shape you your whole life. We want our kids to be equipped with that arrow pointing down message because the world is always going to tell them, excel, do better. You are measured by how good you are or how talented you are. From the time you learn how to walk or ride a bike without training wheels or color in the line or do a spelling test or make it onto a football team or get a part in a play or get a date to homecoming, from that moment on, people are telling you, good job, You are good because of what you can accomplish and what you can create and produce. And you are good because of how smart or beautiful or athletic or unique or talented you are. But even after high school, that message doesn't end. You still will be valued by how much you make, how you raise your family, the things you acquire. And yet, this weird little place called the church says those things don't matter. You are not valued for what you create or produce. You are valued because you are a child of God. That's a different message than you will hear anywhere. This weird little place called the church is the only place that will show you this arrow. This is the arrow where God is saying, hey messed up world, with misplaced priorities. I love you. I died for you. I have already given you value. So just go out and live the life that I have given you. Some days you may feel like you have it all figured out. And you may think that everything is going great out on the field of life. And other days you may feel like you are getting creamed You are getting crushed out there. Either way, Jesus isn't asking you to be perfect. Jesus is asking you to follow. 
and confirmation is a turning point. But it's not the only one. We all have turning points each and every day in our lives where we can begin to unlearn the things that we think we already know. Now, happy Confirmation Day to all of you again who have already been confirmed. Congrats. Amen. Mm -hmm.